Saved by the Bell. Hey folks, I'm Eric, I'm your president, and I want to thank you all for being here at the Washington County Public Affairs Forum. Yay! Yay! Another amazing program, we have Kate Brown. And just before we have Kate Brown up, what I'd like to do is uh, delegate 60 seconds to Doug Hoy from the Aloha <coughs> Community Library Association with a couple brief, quick announcements. Okay. Use the mic. Okay. So we're really excited. Um, we've been open now for a uh, one year. Uh, which is just an amazing, uh, amazing thing. And I'd like to invite all of you to our public open house and anniversary celebration. It'll be on October 20th from 2.30 to 5. And around 3 o'clock, we're going to have some special speakers. So make sure you come around that time. And I'm really excited to, uh, uh, we'll have some special announcements at that time as well. I don't want to give away any secrets today, but I've got some cards to hand out for reminders, and I encourage you to tell your neighbors and your friends, and, uh, and make it a community event, okay? Thanks very much, I'll hand these out. Thank you, Doug. Folks, would you please put your hands together for Kate Brown, our Secretary of State. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my water there, so I might need a oh, Senator sorry, too, Rubio moment, so my apologies. <laughs> Pretty good. Somebody's awake this morning. Um, Kate Brown, currently serving as your Secretary of State, and just delighted and honored to be with you here this afternoon. I started my morning speaking out at Pacific University to Professor Moore's class, uh, so I uh, got peppered by uh, 35 uh, very interested uh, political science students, so I'm very excited to hear from you this afternoon as well. So what I would like to speak about this afternoon is what we're doing to create jobs at the Oregon Secretary of State's office. And while I think it's fair to say that none of us has a silver bullet to fix the economy, all of your elected and appointed officials are working really hard to get Oregonians back to work. But first, I'd like to share a couple of reasons why I'm optimistic about Oregon's future in terms of the economy. Um, we certainly have a tough road to hoe, uh, but let me share a couple of things that give me hope about Oregon and our future. So first of all, Forbes labeled Oregon the 12th most business-friendly state in the nation in 2012. Forbes, yay! That's good news. Forbes uses a number of factors in making this decision, including labor costs, regulatory environment, and quality of life, and of course, labor supply. So that's really good news. Also, a recent statistic I recently heard is very fascinating. Oregon is ranked second in the nation per capita for the number of patents being filed. Now, when I first uh, heard this number, I uh, chalked it up to the number of young creatives moving to Oregon because of our microbrew and bike-friendly culture. Right. Xerox. I don't think that's the only reason. I think there's a number of reasons. But one of the most inter interesting inventions I just heard of was a, about a guy by the name of Mike Slinkard. So Mike was born and raised in John Day, and after high school, he took a job in the timber industry. Well, everyone in this room knows about those jobs in the tinder, timber industry right now. They're few and far between. So when he lost his job in the timber industry, he turned to his passion. And his passion was deer hunting with bows and arrows. So he now has a company in John Day, Oregon, making bows that are sent not only all over the country, but I believe all over the world. And this company has 38 employees. The best news is yet to come. He also has a recent new innovation. It's called a human energy concealment system. I'm going to say that again. Human energy concealment system. It's hunting clothing designed to block the electromagnetic field that we as humans emit. In short, his company now has five 
patents pending. And the good news is, he still lives in John Day, Oregon. The third reason I'm really optimistic about Oregon is what I call the resilience and fortitude of Oregonians like Mike Morrow. I'm using a lot of mics today. So let me tell you a little bit about Mike. Uh, he and his friend Mike uh, grew up on the same street. Uh, they went to grade school together, and they went to college together. And they went to college uh, at OSU. And yay, the, the Beavers, right? Um, and he and Mike uh, ended up working on their senior project together. And their senior project had something to do with wave energy. Uh, so they worked with their professor, they got the project done, they graduated for OSU, they put the project on a shelf. And then they went off to have careers, I think at HP, both Mike and Mike are working at HP, and that's where they met the third Mike. They have a new company, I think everyone in this room has heard of 3M. They are the M3 wave companies, they're literally all three Mikes. And the goal of the project is to use the uh, electric current underneath the waves to create electricity. It's very different than the current type of wave energy that we read about, the buoys. Um, they developed a wave pool. Uh, they developed the project. They put it in the wave pool at OSU. Um, I think now if you go on a Google map, you can actually see uh, the, the project's been moved to a pool in Salem, Oregon. And their goal is to have this project in the water by next summer. They received at this point funding from the Oregon Department of Energy and the, uh, the Wave Energy Trust. So that is the kind of fortitude and resilience that I'm seeing in Oregon that gives me hope that we are going to get through these really tough times. So that's what's going on in the private sector. So let me tell you a little bit about what's going on in the Secretary of State's office. And we have a really important role to play on the job front. Um, so I'd like to share what we're doing at the Secretary of State's office to get Oregonians back to work. So first of all, I oversee the Corporation Division. This is the first place in Oregon that folks come to to get their businesses started in Oregon. And Governor Atia, uh, I just saw his um, wonderful memorabilia at Pacific University this morning, Governor Atia had a vision that our businesses could get everything they needed in one place at the same time. Anybody here been to Fred Meyer's One Stop Shopping? That's what Governor Atia wanted for our businesses. Well, with technology, we've basically been able to do this. We've created our central business registry, which is a central business registry and allows businesses to register online. We're taking that one step further to allow our businesses to connect um, with local governments as well. City of Portland's going to be our first uh, local government. But our goal is to make it as easy as possible to start or expand your businesses in Oregon. So our next tool, uh, just came out last year, is a portal, a collection of websites called Business Express. And Business Express is a really great tool. It enables entrepreneurs or innovators to access the tools and the resources that they need uh, to be successful through the state of Oregon. It's a really <laughs> wonderful tool. We've won two national awards. But for me, as we have the Business Express site, I wanted to make sure that when a business owner ran into regulatory red tape or got frustrated working with a state agency, that the owner could pick up a phone and call somebody and get help. So, with the help of your Oregon legislature, we are creating the Office of Small Business Assistance within the Corporation Division to be there as an advocate for business owners to help them go to bat when they have an issue with a state agency or a state regulation. And this office that we're hiring now uh, is going to be reporting back to the Oregon legislature in 2015 with a clear set of recommendations about how we can encourage businesses to grow and thrive in the state of Oregon. So that's what we're doing in, in Corporation Division to make it as easy as possible for, for businesses to grow and thrive here. Let me move to our Auditing Division. 
Um, this is one of the functions of the Secretary of State's office, and we're doing some very creative work in the auditing division. Right now, we have just completed two audits um, evaluating how well the courses at our community colleges meet the needs of the workforce. So, for example, if there's a forecasted need for nurses in the Salem area, is Chemeketa Community College able to meet that need? So that was one audit that we completed. We made some very clear recommendations. The next audit took a look at community college GED programs. Um, community colleges are the purveyor of GED programs across the state, most of them. Mm -hmm. And we, were, uh, we found one sort of startling fact in doing this particular audit. According to the U.S. Census data, there are over 340,000 Oregonians without a GED or high school diploma. These are obviously Oregonians over the age of 18. 340,000. That's a lot. That's more than the populations of Salem and Eugene combined. I had to check that number because I couldn't believe it, but it's true. So our audit took a look at what are the barriers that uh, folks face that need to get their GED and made some very clear recommendations about how we can improve services so that we can get more of our folks to get a GED and get back into the workforce. So good news is the legislature and the governor are moving forward on those recommendations and that will enable more Oregonians to be employed in the future. So that's what we're doing in, in the audits division to get Oregonians back to work. The last uh, area I'd love to share with you this afternoon has to do with the archives division. And this is, archives is the keeper of Oregon's public history. And I just want to start with a story. Um, Richard Chavs, his grandparents came to America. And they had tickets originally on the Titanic. But they decided their clothes weren't fancy enough, so they took another boat instead. <coughs> Well, Richard's family traveled through Ellis Island and made its way to, of all places, Baker City, Oregon. And in Baker City, Oregon, the Chavs family has been involved in a number of service industries over the years. Richard, I just mentioned him, is a third generation Oregonian. And he, he and his office provide a wonderful array of services. But we've partnered with Chavs Consulting in Baker City to deliver a really wonderful product. It's an electronic records management system, and I'm not going to get into too much detail, but suffice to say it enables our agency, other state agencies, and hopefully local governments as well to easily and affordably manage their electronic records in a way that's affordable for taxpayers and also, frankly, very accessible to taxpayers. So I just want to share one example of this system. I got a request last year for all of the emails that I wrote during my first term of office. It was 80,000 emails. This system was able to pull those emails up in less than two minutes. That makes these records extremely accessible to the public. And because we partnered with this private firm in Baker City, it makes it extremely affordable as well. Oh, and one last piece, because of this private part, public partnership, um, they've been able to put 20 to 25 people back to work in Baker City. And I know in the metro area that might not sound like a lot, but at, for every 20 to 25 people we put to work in rural Oregon, that's like 2,000 to 2,500 people in the metropolitan area. So, yay! So that is what we are doing in the Archives Division. We're doing very creative public-private pri partnerships to help Oregonians get back to work and, frankly, to deliver state services more affordably and more efficiently. We're working really hard in the Audits Division to make sure that we have the workforce that we need for the labor market. And we're working really hard in the corporation division 
to make sure that it's as easy as possible to start or expand your business in Oregon. And what gives me hope, frankly, is the resilience and the fortitude and the incredible creativity that I see from Oregonians everywhere across the state. Thank you so very much. Now, I know this group really likes to ask questions. I don't know if we have time. I'll look to Eric. Do we have time. Okay, good. All right, any questions? Well, I'm at the mic. I'll okay. start. All right. Uh, what I'd like to do is um, uh, ask someone in the room to stand to be recognized, and that's Anthony Mills. Stand, Anthony. Uh, he is uh, one of the instigators who's starting the Aloha Historical Society, an unincorporated area starting a historical society. And you being the custodian of uh, some state history should be aware of that. Um, I'd like to um, make a comment and then ask a question. My comment is that uh, as you are about to engage in an audit of TriMet, that my personal feelings is that TriMet should not be in the business of land use, and TriMet should be in the business of moving people around. And I hope as the audit proceeds that you take that as constructive uh, uh, guidance from a citizen. My, um, uh, my question for you is this. In 2005, March, as I recall, I found myself at the Secretary of State's office. I needed to, well, pimp my resume. And your office was delightfully accommodating at allowing me to become a notary. I found that to be resume jewelry and economically empowering because people sought the fact that they could have a notary on payroll and get stuff done. Has the Secretary of State's office considered doing anything to offer a tiered notary system in addition to the basic notary, doing anything in addition to provide credentials that people can market and make more money with? That's my question. Thank you. That is a great question. Uh, I, not to, to my knowledge am I aware of us looking at a tiered uh, notary system adding additional credentials. We have a very active uh, notary training program uh, both uh, through technology and in person. Our staff in the corporation division uh, likes to get out around the state and do the notary trainings, but we also have it, I, you can get it uh, through technology as well. So thank you. Um, but I will certainly bring, I love taking good ideas back to my staff, um, and I will certainly share that with folks at the Corporation Division. So thank you, Eric. And yes, we are proceeding on an audit of TriMet. The legislature asked us to do so, and we are in the process of that audit. Uh, the audit will be completed in mid-January. Uh, it, it's a high-level uh, audit uh, regarding the agency, uh, so that's all I can say at this point, but it will be completed on time and on schedule. Thank you for coming in today. You're always doing interesting things, so it's nice for you to be here. Thank you. Uh, my question uh, is about something that's also in your purview you didn't talk about, and it's gerrymandering. Uh, there's a lot of things going on around the country that I think the founding fathers would roll over their graves in. And I was just wondering if you would talk a little bit about that and what we do in Oregon. Sure. I'm happy to talk about gerrymandering and our founding fathers and a few foremothers rolling in their graves right now. Uh, just generally speaking, I'm really glad I live in Oregon and that Democrats and Republicans are willing to come together to solve problems, put aside political differences, and tackle the difficult issues of the state. Um, obviously very much in contrast to what's happening at the federal level right now, which uh, is just absolutely and completely unacceptable. In terms of gerrymandering, Oregon, I think, uh, did us really proud. We redistrict in the state, like every other state, uh, every decade. And what happened uh, through the last redistricting, you might recall, and I just spoke on this issue at a leadership forum, so it's fresh in my mind, is that the last time Oregon went through redistricting, we had a uh, equal split in the House, 30 Republicans, 30 Democrats. We had co-speakers, Arne Robland uh, from Coos Bay and Bruce Hanna from Roseburg. And Peter Courtney is president of the Senate. They put together a bipartisan committee to draft the redistricting plan. And I will tell you that they were able to come up with a plan, reach bipartisan agreement, and it's the first time there was absolutely no legal challenge on redistricting since I was born in the state of Oregon. And that's been a really long time. So your Oregon legislature did it right. Uh, they came together. They put aside political differences. And that's what should be happening all across the, the country, frankly. 
Chris Leslie, board member. I read a number of uh, studies that indicate increased taxes take revenue away from small businesses. And if there's any uh, plans for taxes or your comments on this. Sure. As you all know, the, the legislature uh, met last week in special session and did uh, some tax pieces. Um, one would continue the uh, higher tax rate for large corporations. Uh, the second piece will provide uh, LLCs, limited liability companies, uh, partnerships, and S-Corps, uh, smaller businesses, with what I would call a significant tax break. I think uh, we must work uh, to make sure, and I actually just met with the Small Business Task Force, to ensure that the mom and pops, the smaller businesses, have an even more uh, favorable tax climate than they do now. So I think that was the missing piece from the package. I'm confident that your Oregon legislature will work to uh, come up with some solutions in that arena. And uh, in meeting with the co-chairs of the Small Business Task Force, they're very interested in this issue as well. So we certainly need to take a look at it. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, John Bell, forum member. Uh, I'm interested in the, in the inspector general function of the state of, uh, Secretary of State. And uh, I, you know, our, uh, like TriMet and other governmental agencies that, that seem to have no auditing or... Are we doing the problem, the programs that we were set up to do and efficiently? And we need to have the, uh, the IG for the military point back. Inspector General's uh, doing that, then that function. I'd like to see uh, more of what you, they are doing in that area for a lot of state government agencies. In. Sure. Um, I'll take that as a somewhat open question to respond more generally about the work we're doing in auditing. So I mentioned I'm the chief auditor as well. I'm actually the only Secretary of State in the nation that oversees this auditing function. I shared with students earlier, State of Washington elects a lieutenant governor, a secretary of state, and a chief auditor, a aud state auditor. I basically do all three of those jobs for less than the price of one of them in Washington. So you're getting a great deal in your secretary of state here. But I don't have other secretaries that I can talk with about in terms of the auditing function. We have the constitutional authority to do financial audits. I call financial audits follow the money audits making sure that dollars are spent the way they are intended. Um, to give you a really concrete example of a financial audit, one of my auditors was in uh, the employment division, it was probably about a year ago, found that we had used the formula incorrectly and that the federal government owed us, owed the state of Oregon, over $180 million once we got those numbers corrected. So these are very important audits that we are doing to make sure that we're following the law, but also obviously getting the resources for Oregon that we need. So that's financial auditing. Um, the bulk of our work in auditing is financial audits. We have 70 auditors total. The other area, and I mentioned this briefly, is performance auditing. And in performance auditing, we ask the question, how can we deliver state services more effectively and more efficiently? How can we make sure that you are getting the biggest bang for your taxpayer dollars? And this is where, as your Secretary of State, I've really focused my work. Just to give you some numbers, because I know you guys are numbers, your policy wonks, but in 08, for every dollar you gave us for performance auditing, we were able to deliver $8 in savings and efficiencies. Good return. In 2012, for every dollar you gave us for performance auditing, we were able to deliver $44 in savings and efficiencies. That's a real return on your investment in performance auditing. So that's the kind of work. In performance auditing, we don't do so many of these every year. Right now, just to give you an example, we're auditing the TriMet Agency, the Metropolitan Transit Agency. Uh, we are auditing the um, health licensing boards and commissions, the boards that oversee physicians, chiropractors, nurses, all of those boards. Tony, you want to help me out? What other audits are we in right now? TANF, uh, Temporary ass uh, Assistance to Needy Families. So that gives you kind of what uh, we're auditing right now. We just completed a couple of very important audits. And if you want to read any one of these audits, you can go online and pull them up. 
Um, in fact, I should have done that because I couldn't sleep last night and it would have been a great uh, way to go to sleep. So, for example, also in performance auditing, we just completed an audit of uh, teacher preparation and that we found while well, we need to do more work, um, our teachers need to have the tools so that they can be effective in our classrooms. If we want our students to be successful, we need to make sure that the teachers have the tools that they need. And in one place, it's making sure that our public universities, our teaching colleges, provide our teachers with the training that they need. And the audit talks about recommendations. I just said, mentioned the community college workforce development audit and the GED audit. So that's the kind of sense of the audits we're doing in performance auditing. And then lastly, we do IT audits, auditing the security of technology systems. I don't normally talk about that because most of our findings are confidential. But suffice to say, we want to make sure you can't hack into our systems. Um, and I know we know there's a lot of smart folks out there, so we want to make sure folks can't hack into our systems. So in answer to your question, um, we audit a number of agencies regularly. We are focusing our work now on where the dollars are in the performance auditing arena. So in education and in human services, we just finished an audit of the Department of Corrections. Um, fiscal auditing, we audit, for example, you mentioned Oregon Department of Transportation. We audit them on a regular basis. And agencies also have internal audits as well. I could talk to you for another two hours about auditing, but I don't want you to put you to sleep. So that gives you a general sense of the work we're doing in auditing. But I'm really proud of the work we're doing in our auditing team. It's a really talented group of folks. And we're working closely with the federal government, the GAO General Accountability <coughs> Office, as well, to make sure that we are doing the best job we can for Oregonians. So thank you. Patrick Ritter, board member, thanks for coming, Kate. Thanks. The Betsy program, did you audit it? What did you find? And what's the result? Um, thank you. Great question. I do not believe that we audited the Betsy program. Uh, the, uh, the program started and clearly there were a number of, uh, uh, it, it was a substantially more expansive tax break than uh, the legislature intended. And I believe in 2011, they limited the criteria and the um, companies that were uh, available for the Betsy audit. We have not audited that particular program, though we have audited the Department of Energy uh, in the past. And when there's a change of director, we also uh, regularly do audits for agencies. Jim Kate, four member, follow-up question on redistricting. Mm -hmm. um, during the redistricting process, it was often framed as either go with the old redistricting or the new one will be worse, at least for Washington County. Because Washington County is still being disenfranchised based on per capita demographics. It's Washington County is still owed one and a half more state rep districts in Washington County and one extra state senate district. And there's a state senate district that is split half in Multnomah County. There's a state house district that is still stretches from Rock Creek and Aloha to West Lynn. So to say the redistricting was a success, that's, it could have been worse, but in, towards Washington County, we're still being disenfranchised. So it wasn't a success for Washington County. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. My understanding is, uh, I hear what you're saying in terms of Washington County getting its fair share and um, how districts are split up. Um, I think the key for legislative districts is to make sure that we have um, done a good job uh, reflecting community interests, uh, that we keep communities together and that we have districts that make sense. But the other key piece is to make sure that they have equal numbers of populations in the districts as well. And so to the extent uh, the legislature uh, did a really good job, I think, meeting the statutory goals, could they have done better? Totally yes. Um, but I think that's important as we move forward. I think there's some statutory changes needed for redistricting uh, moving forward. Uh, I anticipate they'll start having those conversations in 2016 and 2008. No, we meet in odd number of years. Uh, 17 probably is when folks will be having that conversation. But I think it's really important that you weigh in with your legislators about this issue. Obviously, your Washington County legislators are familiar with it. But I think it's important to weigh in ahead of time. A lot of times what happens with redistricting is we wait until it's time to do it, and then we say we need to make these fixes. And what would make sense to me is that maybe in 2015, 2017, there were some key recommendations that a number of organizations made after the 2011 redistricting 
that uh, the legislature should be taking a look at those in 2015 and 2017. And I'll put that on my legislative agenda for 2015. So thank you. All right. Okay, um, John McWilliams, board member. Uh, nice to see you. Nice to see you too. It's been a long time. So uh, you are uh, somewhat interested in voting and uh, getting out the vote. And uh, not too long ago, we had uh, something come up about uh, maybe increasing the number of uh, voter registration uh, through driver's license, uh, something of that nature. Would you mind uh, talking a little bit more about that and talking about, because it didn't quite make it, but talk about uh, what needs to be done to make sure that it gets through this time. Sure, thank you for the question. So, as your chief elections officer, it is my mission to make sure that every eligible Oregonian has their voice be heard. And Oregon, as you know, has a really wonderful system for voting. It's called Vote by Mail. Um, there are two states that have now followed our lead, Washington and Colorado. The good news about Vote by Mail is that it's really convenient, it's really accessible, it's really affordable, and it's very secure. It doesn't get much better than that. But the best part about the system is that we use it. And I will tell you that in the last several general elections, Oregon's turnout rate amongst registered voters has been some of the highest in the nation. That's how I know we like vote by mail, because we use it. It's really, really important if you're going to have a system for democracy that people be able to use it. Well, where we've kind of fallen behind or been mediocre is in the registration ar arena. I think we're just a little bit above average. Not good enough for me as your chief elections officer. So we've done a couple of things. We moved to an online voter registration system. So if you have a driver's license or a state ID card, you can register to vote. You can change your voter registration, uh, uh, if your address. You can change your party if you're unhappy with your party. You can do it all online with your driver's license or state ID card. We've had over 350,000 Oregonians use that system. So it's been very successful. Um, the last numbers I saw, we saw had over 90 people from the ages of 90 to 99 use it. So that's good news. Not just for young people anymore. The last session I introduced legislation to simplify and modernize Oregon's election system. When we introduced vote by mail, it was the idea that we would put a ballot in the hands of every eligible Oregonian. And the policy I had in front of the legislature would virtually do that. It would have registered about 90% of Oregonians who have provided proof of citizenship, a digital signature with age and residency data. So it was very secure. It was building on our online system. Uh, the bill uh, made it through the House, uh, died on the Senate floor. Uh, but if anybody who knows me <clears throat> very well, you know that I don't give up easily. And I anticipate you'll see that proposal or a similar one in the 2015 legislative session. Um, we are, excuse me for just a minute. We are, uh, we watched Colorado, state of Colorado move to a very, probably the most progressive voting uh, access system in the country this last session. They will mail a ballot to every Coloradan and um, they have same-day voter registration as well. And they also have voting senders. So Colorado is doing everything it can uh, to make sure that its citizens participate. I think we in Oregon should be doing the same thing. So thanks for the question. Go ahead. And how are you? I'm doing great. Nice to see you here. Thanks for coming. Karen Bolin, forum member. So California is going to allow people without um, social security numbers to get driver's licenses. So I'm wondering if Oregon is going to follow in that same pattern. Um, so we, the Oregon legislature passed legislation, I think in 07, um, that required proof of citizenship for driver's licenses. Um, and then in the 2000, and, uh, what year is this? This is 13. It was 11 session. Uh, the Oregon legislature is allowing folks who are here uh, but not citizens to get driver's license and I believe that bill will be implemented in January of 2014 as I recall so the answer to your question is yes uh, we uh, actually beat California to the punch on this one and will allow people who are not here legally to get driver's licenses 
And I should say, uh, actually, I almost, uh, um, I should say, there are a, a number of folks who are gathering signatures to put that particular measure on the ballot. Uh, they turned in signatures on Friday. That's why I'm stopping myself. Uh, they turned in signatures on Friday. Uh, we will be going through uh, the process that we go through to verify signatures to determine whether that will be referred to the ballot in November of 2014. So the law, the law would be going into effect if it doesn't make it to the ballot. So I'm just correcting myself. It will not uh, uh, be going into the effect if they have the signatures to put it on the ballot. So thank you. I don't know. That wasn't a trick question, I know. But as I was thinking through this, they passed the law, and then I realized we've got signatures in our office. Go ahead. Oh, no, tough question, I can tell. <laughs> it might be planned. OK. No. One, um, Chris Leslie, former member, again, the idea of uh, you speaking to us today is great. It shows how much a politician can really say that means something rather than some of the people we have normally. <laughs> and that's a Republican speaking. So, we're open-minded. The idea of uh, the sh government shutdown, federal shutdown, how does that affect us? Great question, and thank you for the question. I just have to share, though, uh, the story first, and that is um, I went to a uh, conference while I was a legislator on how elected officials can build credibility with their constituents. And the lesson I learned is that when you make promises on the campaign trail, you have to make sure you can deliver on them. And the way this was illustrated in the workshop is the facilitator asked who in the room can do 20 push-ups. And I, of course, raised my hand <laughs> along with several other legislators in the room. And halfway through the workshop, she made two of us come up and do our 20 push-ups. Well, the good news was for Oregon, I could do the 20 push-ups. Yeah. The bad news for what in New Mexico is he couldn't. So that was a really important lesson for me, is that when you make promises on the campaign trail, make sure you can deliver on them. So I thought you needed a happy news story before the bad news story. So in answer to your question of the government shutdown, I, I think this is affecting all of us. Um, from my perspective, it is unacceptable. And I think uh, our, our National Congress should be more like our Oregon legislature and folks should be working together to put aside their political differences to come together for the good of the country. Is it impacting us? Yes, it is impacting us economically in Oregon. And I'll just tell you on my agency level, for example, we work closely with the Government Accountability Office in our auditing work. You know, it's shut down. We can't get the information we need or work with them and collaborate with them to deliver better services for Oregonians. So, I hope this ends quickly. Uh, I think we all need to be calling and emailing our congressional delegation. I know the Oregon delegation is doing everything they can to solve the problem, uh, but they need to hear from you. Um, so, thank you. Harry Bodine, for a member. Kate, I'm coming back to gerrymandering again. Okay. <clears throat> It, there's an underlying theme here about what's happening across the country, you know, I think. It is happening across the country. And it, this congressional district we're in is a gerrymandered congressional district. <clears throat> Democrats have controlled this seat for two generations, 40 years straight. The lines keep getting adjusted every 10 years to make sure this does not change. It does. And the same thing's happening state after state. We have a Congress who basically 95% of them will get reelected because... Their districts are designed that so they can't lose. The other party can't win them. So that's one reason maybe that they're not too concerned. Nobody's talking to each other in Washington, D.C. So I guess my question is, uh, <clears throat> I like to compare us to Canada. Up there, districts' lines are not done by the people who benefit from them. They're done by totally people who have no connection with the parties at all. 93, they had an election. At the end of it, the, the, the governing party was dropped down to two members of the House of Commons. Is there a Democrat in this room who, who would not like to see that happen to <laughs> Republicans or Tea Party in 2014, for example, just to, down to two? 
it doesn't, it, it can happen there because the lines are drilling, so the people, votes can really count. Here, we're channeled, and we have been more, more each decade. So is there a solution to this? Is there anything that could be done about it besides just, you know, if, if you're one of the 56% of the voters in this district who are either non-aligned or Republican, you might as well stay home because you can't win it the way the lines are drawn now. And we have 40 years of experience to prove that. Your comment. Uh, sure, thank you. And I, I think, and uh, Tony and I were just talking about this on the way over in terms of Oregon. We have five congressional districts. I would argue that we have two Democratic safe seats at this point. The Washington... Three. Three. Uh, three, yes, three. Thank you. Three, three, three. Uh, the Walden seat, obviously, Repo safe for Republican. The Blumenauer seat, uh, safe for Democrat. I think the Bonamici seat now safe, pretty safe for Democrats. But I would argue that you have two swing seats left in the state of Oregon, the Schrader seat and the DeFazio seat. Um, in terms of redistricting, you might recall that the Republicans were in control of the legislature in 2001, and they were in charge of redistricting. And the reason why I was so excited about the 2011 uh, legislative bipartisan redistricting process um, was that I had proposed to uh, Gene Durfler, who was president of the Senate then, that we should have a bipartisan committee for redistricting in 2001. And he turned me down, uh, and uh, they drew a plan, and it was challenged in the courts, and the courts, uh, my recollection, uh, changed the plan as not meeting uh, community interests. So the courts drew the plan in 2001, the congressional plan, as I recall. Um, and I believe they also upheld, uh, they, didn't, they didn't uphold the legislative plan. I think they upheld a, another plan as well. So the courts did the plan in 2001. I think what was good about this process in 2011 is that you had equal representation from both Republicans and Democrats coming together to draw the plan. I, I clearly folks are unhappy in Washington County about how the lines were drawn, but it was drawn on a bipartisan basis after extensive public hearings. Now where do we go moving forward? Uh, a number of states, handful of states have gone to independent uh, redistricting commissions. Some successful, I would argue some not. So in Washington State, uh, it is an independent redistricting commission. Uh, I think it is fairly successful in Washington. However, um, the commission is appointed, each caucus leader, Republican, Democrat in the House, Republican, Democrat in the Senate, appoints a member to the commission, and then they have a fifth party as a, a decider. Um, I actually think that the legislature is more representative of the population than a particular commission like that. In California, they went through all sorts of hoops to appoint a redistricting commission, and they, that now, I believe that plan is still in the courts, um, but it was as fair and independent as a commission could be, and the Republicans are challenging it in uh, the courts in California. So it doesn't matter what system we have, people are going to challenge it. What I think is important is that you have good representation from the public on the redistricting committee, um, that you have an opportunity for public hearings, and that you have a clear set of statutory criteria about how to draw the lines. So this is a challenge nationally. You know, I know. As we grow as a country, we are beginning more and more to live, work, and hang out, for lack of a better word, with people who think like us. And so it is going to be more of a challenge moving forward in redistricting. I mean, there's challenges all over from Texas to um, to uh, Wisconsin about redistricting. I think we've got to figure out a better way to do redistricting, but no one in my mind has really come up with the answer. Um, it is a huge challenge. And I think if uh, we got to figure out a way to do it in a way that makes sense. So if you have suggestions, love to have this conversation because clearly we need to kind of push the legislature to talk about it in 2015. That was a really long winded answer to your question. Love to have further conversations. Eric Squires, former president. We're a little, a little ahead of schedule, so I'm going to open it up to any member in the, uh, the audience who wants to ask questions, not just forum members. Uh, so I'm going to go for a second bite at the apple. Oh, this, this is a visual question. 
I just handed Kate Brown my driver's license, and Kate, I'd like to ask you to look at my height. The last time I did jury duty, Judge Gail Nadigal said that some state databases uh, are better maintained than others. So Kate, if you're reading that correctly, the Oregon Department of Motor Vehicles says that I'm two foot eight inches tall. Yes. So I may be old enough to drive, I may have passed the test, but I may not be tall enough to drive. I I'm smiling because it also tells me how much is he weighs and it's not very much. <laughs> well, it's, the state thinks I weigh 130 pounds and at two foot eight, if you compute my body mass index, you've just met the fattest man on the planet. <laughs> So uh, anyway, I wanted to kind of uh, set, the, set the stage for asking you about something completely different, a database that you manage. Thank you for the courtesy laughs. Um, Oristar. Oristar is something I've used because I've run for office, but that's not a topic that I've heard discussed, and I'm wondering if you could give us the, uh, the airplane view or just uh, an overview of, of what's going on with Oristar from the perspective of the Secretary of State's office. Thank you, Eric. I had no idea that a driver's license was going to get me to Oristar, but great transition there. So uh, as your chief elections officer, I oversee Oregon's campaign finance system. We are one of, I believe, four states in the country with no restrictions on the amount of money that candidates and ballot measures can take. So if one of you wanted to write a check for a million dollars and I didn't get any takers in my class at Pacific University, I could take it. If Coca-Cola or Pepsi, I'll be fair, wanted to write me, the company wanted to write me a check, I could take it. However, what we do have is a very transparent reporting system to enable Oregonians to follow the money in politics. And the system came about, actually, when I was in the legislature, partnered with a uh, bipartisan group of legislators, two R's, two D's, to develop the system. We partnered with uh, Secretary Bradbury at the time. And the goal was to enable a high level of transparency in uh, candidate campaigns. Oregon's system ranks in the top five in the country in terms of it being transparent. Uh, I will tell you I think there needs to be more improvements. It needs to be user friendly. And Eric, I welcome your suggestions. You can just email me. You, got me. you have my card. I really want to hear from people as we move forward about how we can make changes to the system. However, the bottom line is you can find out how much money I raised in 2012 and how I spent it. You can also tell, I'll, I'll use this even though my grand, grandfather's no longer with us, in 2008 my grandfather wrote me a check. Uh, he was living then in the uh, great state of Minnesota and because he was an out-of-state donor it was highlighted in red. So it's a really wonderful system. Um, like I said, more improvements, uh, but it enables Oregonians to follow the money in politics. Where we've been focusing on is that the system requires candidates to report every 30 days until the last seven weeks of the campaign. During the last seven weeks, it moves to seven-day reporting. We've been trying to increase the reporting during the last three weeks when Oregonians have their ballots in their hands and the most amount of money is being spent. Between a Democrat and a Republican legislature, we haven't been able to move that bill, but we will. I don't give up easily. Um, I think the other discussion we need to have, frankly, as a state, is whether we're willing to be uh, the second highest spending per capita uh, money in the legislature in the nation. And I think it's time to have a reasonable conversation about campaign finance reform. <coughs> that I'm happy to come talk to you about in more detail, but um, that is another discussion. But for now, we've got a very transparent uh, campaign finance reporting system. So, thanks, Eric. Go ahead, Spencer. Hi, uh, Spencer Ehrman. I appreciate the opportunity to ask a question. Uh, voting rights are under attack across the country. In the last election, your opponent's largest contributors were political action committees from other places than Oregon, um, whose business it is to advance voter restrictive uh, legislation in other states. Um, I think we can expect to see some bills come forward in the 2015 legislature to restrict voting access in Oregon. Do you, do, uh, first question is, do you think that will happen? Do you expect that to happen? And if so, um, what, can be, what can we be doing um, in advance of that to try and curtail uh, outside forces trying to restrict voter access in Oregon. Okay. Um, let's see. How am I going to respond to that? So 
Uh, I think there are uh, attempts in Oregon to restrict access to the ballot, and you'll probably see legislation introduced, but I don't think it will be successful. And I say this just very respectfully because uh, I won in 2012 by talking about increasing access to the ballot, and the percentage that I won by sent a very clear message that Oregonians will not tolerate restricting access to the ballot. That's one. Secondly, um, I think Oregon ought to be the leader, or one of the leaders, in uh, ensuring people's franchise. And that's why I've worked to expand the franchise, not only through technical means with online voter registration, but our voter registration modernization legislation. <laughs> but also, frankly, just on the ground, talking to students. If we could get five out of every five students by the age of 25 voting regularly, we will have created a, a, a group of young people that are committed voters. So talking to Pacific University, I was out uh, at a high school last week, you know, just talking with students all the time to let them know that their voices are important and that voting can have a real impact on not only in their lives, but on all of our lives. Um, the last piece I would say, with vote by mail, it's a little bit harder to restrict the franchise. And I believe specifically one of the issues my opponent raised was uh, uh, proof of citizenship before voter registration. That was one of the discussion items. I, I just do not believe that Oregonians will tolerate any restriction on the franchise, and I think we should be the leader moving forward, moving this country forward. So um, those efforts will not be successful, at least not on my watch. Bill Kroger again. Uh, this is a follow-up to Chris's question about the government shutdown. Uh, the second thing coming up is the uh, debt ceiling problem. And uh, all the pundits and a lot of the news people are saying that this is by far the worst of the two. I was just wondering, I'm sure you people have, you and your staff have talked about ramifications, and I was wondering if maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Um, thanks, Bill. Uh, we have not talked about it uh, because we just haven't. But I've certainly thought about it, uh, watched uh, Washington Week in Review, um, which actually Friday's program, if you haven't seen it, was fabulous. Um, I think what I, what I would say is, um, as I mentioned earlier, this is unacceptable. But I think our president is um, very clear about not willing to negotiate on either of these items. And I think he doesn't have a choice. And the reason why I think he doesn't have a choice is if um, this president can be held hostage on this issue. Presidents out in the future can be held hostage. And I don't want to sound partisan, but I just think that's a fundamental uh, issue that we are going to have to put to rest absolutely right now. And, you know, at least on the health care uh, system, you know, what can I say? The legislation passed, the Supreme Court upheld it. Uh, the president won re-election. Discussion over, implemented, move forward. And I, I think we will see that this will not be a successful way to negotiate in the future. So, John, holy smokes, you guys are getting, giving me questions from all over the map. Uh, John Bell, forum member. Uh, if, if, if the uh, opponents to the driver license get enough uh, signatures, can we have that anyway a... a, a the election on May rather than wait until November. We have hundreds of, if not thousands of, of uh, they're illegal, we know it. I have to go to Washington State to get driver's licenses. Or they're driving, then they're driving around with, with no driver's license, no insurance. You have to have a driver's license before you can get insurance. So it's, a, you know, or we wait, wait, wait until November to find out how we, to we make these people legal. Uh, um I'll have Tony check this, but I believe uh, if they get the signatures, it'll be on the November 2014 ballot, as I recall. I don't think we have any discretion. Okay. He says we don't have any discretion. No, no, so, no okay. So Thank you very much. I, there are ways. If the legislature had uh, thought about this as a possibility, they could spe set the election date, but they did not do that. So. Because we have uh, thousands of people, their driver's license are expiring, and they can't get a new one. I understand that uh, a lot of people on many sides of this issue feel very strongly. Um, I actually fought against uh, the criteria in 2007 to require proof of citizenship. 
uh, to get a driver's license because I know there are thousands, probably close to hundreds of thousands of folks living in Oregon that are working very hard every single day that need to be able to get to work. They are a crucial part of our economy. And I think the bill that the legislature passed was a reasonable compromise under the circumstances. When Eric gave me his um, driver's license, I thought he was going to ask about this question. Our um, driver's license are very secure, right? What do you have to bring when you go in to renew your driver's license? You have to bring proof of citizenship now. Um, I was born in Spain. I have to bring my birth certificate or my passport. I'm hoping I never lose my birth certificate in Spain because that will be an expensive replacement born on an Air Force base. So I could still run for president, but don't worry. Um, so our, our driver's licenses are secure to the level that the TSA uses them for security when you get on an airplane. And my opinion is if it's good enough for the TF TSA, it's good enough for me. However, I think it's important for folks that are living and working in Oregon be able to drive to work legally. And I believe, um, you know, you're going to have, I don't know whether you will have the opportunity to vote on that or not. Um, like we said, it's in November. We don't have the discretion. I just don't know whether there are enough valid signatures or not. But what I will say is that I think it's really important in Oregon that we have the ability as citizens to refer measures that we're unhappy with in the legislature. It's part of our culture, it's part of our history, um, and I think that's a really important uh, part of what makes Oregon, Oregon. So, thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, John. All right, you guys. Thank you very much. Truly an honor and a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. I stole, those, I stole those from 12 Hills Park and Rec District when they were looking. Okay. No, you didn't. <laughs> I didn't. Thank you, Eric. Thank you so much. That was great. Kate Brown is always an amazing speaker, and I just feel so privileged we got her today. I'd like to close the meeting out with a few quick comments that uh, our upcoming schedule allows us to invite uh, Brian Wardner from Twalton River Keepers on the 14th, our next meeting. On October 21st, we have Richard Hornbrick. Horner Nick, I can't pronounce his name, from the Washington County Assessment and Taxation Department. On October 30th, we have Ted Wheeler, our state treasurer. And just uh, breaking news, we're going to have on, I think, November 4th, Chris Anderson, the publisher of The Oregonian here. And that organization has gone through a lot of changes, and I think that will be a very timely and exciting topic. Uh, I'd like to conclude another successful forum, and thank you for your attendance. Bye-bye.